Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, um, my name is Helen, and I am a, an alcoholic. Um, thank you, Mel. Um, I'm going to say I'm nervous, because um, I am. Um, thank you so much for asking me. It's, um, it is a pleasure um, and an honour. Um, I don't share that often as, as main shares, so um, bear with me. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm an alcoholic. Um, and it's just lovely to see so many people here that I know um, and new friends um, as well. Oh, you know, on this meeting tonight, which is an absolute joy, is um, my younger sister, who um, it's just it's just amazing. She'll come into my story in a little while, but it's just so beautiful that, that she's here and she's actually celebrating four months today. Um, which is just, just, you know, just blows me away. Um, right, where to start? Um, I'm not really going to go into um, a drunk log um, in my share because we all drank differently, different amounts, different, different ways, you know. Um, however, What I'd like to try and start with is how I was before I started drinking and how it was when I was. And it's really, for me, it was more about the feelings and, and not understanding what was wrong with me. I, um, I actually took my first drink at the age of 13 out with my dad. Um, Irish family, um, drink was... Not so much in the home at that time, but drink was... Or we always went out with dad and, and whatever. And it was very much I was that I was that child. There's no drama really in, in 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 my story. There's no hospitals. There's no jails. There's no. I never got caught for drinking driving. I um, everything was very. I was very much the the little girl. That, I was never the rebellion, the rebellious type. But I, what I was, I conformed, and whoever you wanted me to be, I would be, and that was from a young age. Um, I was always the the good girl at school. Um, didn't do very well in school, but I was always a good girl in school. I always wanted to please my mum and dad, especially my dad. Um, friends that I had, if they were, um, there was a family over the road that were, that, that, that were teddy girls and teddy boys. Yeah, Helen got the full skirt so she could fit into that. Had my first drink, and when he went out for a drink with my dad, you were seen and not heard. I had two halves of lager and lime and um, found a voice and became, felt like I'd become accepted into that, into his crowd of these big burly Irishmen. So that was my first real experience of, of what it could do for me. It gave, it made me feel like a part of something. As I progressed on, um, really started, my drinking started when I was about 17. 16, 17, left school, left home and moved in with my nan. Now, at this point, um, Helen hadn't got a curfew. Helen had got a key to the front door and Helen found the pubs that she could go to, the people who drank like Helen. They were bikers. They were, so Helen decided to wear the leather boots and, you know, and fit in that way. I was always a girl who drank pints. I never drank a half, couldn't see the point of it. Always the one who was left at the end of the, the end of the evening, still carrying on, and was looked upon as she's the girl to go drinking with. Um, that just progressed to from, from that really from about the age of seventeen. I became a daily drinker straight after work. Uh, worked with men, you know, worked in a printer's uh, or a preprint company, and again conformed to the expectations of being this production manager at the age of 19. So Helen put on this, this quite hard facade. Um, and going out with them and ordering a pint and standing at the bar and, you know, wait, it was at the time when you had to knock on the door to get into the pubs. You know, it wasn't all day opening. 
So it was, you know, standing at the bar and, and I'm drinking pints and, and carrying on. And if they left, then I stayed. It was then going into, you know, drinking after hours and after hours clubs being locked in, all of that scenario. Through all of that, I never saw the progression. You know, I was out lots of weekends and I'd come home and go straight to work and, and all of that carried on. Um, just, I jump a little bit and I do apologise. Um, my team, my drinking at that point worked amazingly. Loved it, loved everything it did for me. I could be who you wanted me to be, but I was always the, um, I was quite loud mouthed. Um, however, there was always a load of men around me because there was a, I, I, I drank with a load of men. Um, met my, um, but I always felt that I never, they say you don't fit in. It wasn't that I didn't fit in. I always felt apart from because I could fit in. I could fit in because I could make myself fit in. But I always felt apart from and always felt that I had to prove something. Always felt I had to prove something, whether it was in my job, whether it was at home, whether it was when I was little and cleaning the house for mom when, when my sisters were little. Um, mom was very poorly when she had, had my, my younger siblings and um, I looked after them for, for, for a little while. Um, so the house was always clean and I had to do that and, you know, to make everyone think that Helen is the, is the good girl and be proud of Helen. So I got to, to 23 and I've changed jobs and I've got a career in advertising. And again, in advertising, I was going out at lunchtimes. I was going out after work. I was, I got a place of my own next door, but one to my mom and dad. Um, drank with my dad, at, you know, at the, of an evening. And then I met my husband again in a pub. Um, we moved in very quickly together um, and oh, got my career carrying on going and I caught for my son at the age, no, my drinking is daily and my drinking had been daily from the age of six, 17, 18, 16, 17, 18 and it wasn't, I get up in the morning and have a drink, it was just every night and it would be plenty of drink. Um, met my husband at the age of 23, 24 and um, moved in together very quickly and then conformed again. Now, we caught, we had great time. Drinking was a very big part of our lives. Travel was a very big part of our life. I caught for my son at the age of 29. Um, and we were very, very lucky enough that I could actually be a stay-at-home mom. I had my son. We got married nine months later. Found out I was pregnant again. I then created or manifested this personality of um and some of you will remember us some of you won't and doris day the the perfect housewife the perfect mother i got the whitewashed cottage and the picket fence you know husband would go out to work in the morning i would put the pinny on clean babies would be cleaned house would be clean, dinner on the table, pinny on when he got home and you know, dinner out and, and his drink on the table to sit down and have dinner. That's who I became, this illusion of perfection, total perfection in, in, that I, I needed to. Um, so somewhere deep down, I never actually knew who Helen was at all because she always had a character, always had a character. But this character of Doris Day, Continued. I had four children in uh, in under six years. Drank um, in my pregnancies. I curbed it a little bit. Um, so at thirty four, I'd had um, my last daughter. Um, and from the outside, my life looked absolutely perfection. The house, the cars, the children going off to private school. The holidays abroad and I've got these little these three little girls I've got my son and then these three little girls and they'd all go off to school in little boat hats and it was all just perfect and Helen would put the makeup on and she would have the nails done and she'd have the heels on and it all carried on like that for years um and again Doris Day was still there in the house and 
But gradually through all of this, I was, I was going. Any emotion, it was just the drink. Whereas I hear people say the drink took the husband. What, if the drink didn't take the husband, it wouldn't take the husband. You know, bless his heart, he stayed through the lot. Um, I heard people say, oh, bless my husband. I was like, mine went, where'd he go? However, um, it, it started to erode whatever emotion was in was inside of me. Um, I'd, I could say to my children, I love them. And I absolutely, absolutely did. But I actually got to a point where I didn't understand what that really meant anymore. Um, every time I would put a drink in front, my, my one daughter was in, in hospital with meningitis. And there was half a bottle of vodka in my car. And I would go from the ward and I would go down to my car and have a drink. So I would do anything for my children, but there would be a drink first. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't see this. That was, that's a, that's a real part of it that I didn't see that it was killing me emotionally. Um, and my, it just progressed to, I'd have postnatal, postnatal groups and I'd have all the friends, the, the, the ladies I'd met in postnatal group because Doris Day has put sandwiches on in the afternoons on a Tuesday and has the mums around with the babies and it's a great time to open a bottle of wine and everyone bring wine around and, because it's sociable. I don't remember the time when I thought, and I don't remember what year, that I thought it was okay to drink vodka straight from the bottle. I remember going to the doctors and saying to the doctor, I'm panicking because I've got no Coca-Cola to put in the vodka. And my doctor said, well, if you drank like me, then you'd have an issue and sent me away with some tablet. I remember ringing Alcoholics Anonymous, sitting on my kitchen floor when I'd got a couple of cans of cider. My children were only young, so I'm going back 20 odd years, 20 years, and sitting there crying, saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and then I'd have another drink and just forget about it because I felt better after another drink. Mm. Where my where it took me was that I had to drink to breathe. I would wake up in the morning and, and I don't know how many years I did this for. This is the truth. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd take my first breath. And the only way I could take another breath was to have another drink. And that was after I'd done the gag, you know. And my infamous back step, I would be sitting on at half past five, six o'clock in the morning. I'd have that drink and it may, I may have a quarter of a bottle of vodka. I might have drank half a bottle of vodka at that point. I have no idea. However, that would get me up and ready to get my children ready for school. And it's amazing that I can actually say that to you guys, because if I said that to somebody else, I'd probably be locked up. Um, my children were after school. I was drinking and driving, never got caught. I would have my children in the car and drink and drive. Driving up a motorway, I would have a half a bottle of vodka in my car. Um, I would have drink hidden all over the house. Um, as my children got older, it became more noticeable. Um, but people who came into my life at that point just knew me as, as, as as Helen, they're still doing the Doris Day thing, the Stepford wife, still doing the robotic cleaning the house, getting the ironing done, the dinners on the tables. And whoever knew me then, I was just constantly at a level of, there was, I was always drinking my system for, for years. If you'd have breathalyzed me 20 years ago or five and a half years ago, there was constant drinking my system. There probably wasn't a day, I don't, it was two weeks I did a home detox. Um, but those are probably the only days that, I'd never, that I hadn't had a drink in my system. On holiday, I would find it, you know, wherever. So it got to a point um, 
six years ago, just over six years ago, where I'd, I'd, I'd done two home detoxes and, and family had come to stay with me because you have to have somebody come and stay with you in case you have seizures and, and all of that. So and by, by the fifth day, Helen's feeling fantastic, you know, no alcohol in the system, goes and get her hair done, goes and get her nails done, feeling great, hair's done, looking good, lost a couple of pounds because she's not bloated, takes her mum to the train station, gets on the train, mum gets on the train, turn around, I call it the spot by half a bottle of vodka and it's drank by the time I get home. No idea why, no idea why. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. <clears throat> that happened twice. Then it got to, I was seeing a, a drug and alcohol counsellor through my doctor who was breathalyzing me every Friday morning. Um, and I'm going, yeah, I'm not drinking. And, you know, it's like, Helen, I'm going to take, if you, if you blew one more, I'm going to take the keys off you. And, and I used to have an appointment with him at nine o'clock in the morning, you know. And, you know, I'm going to take your keys off you, Helen. It's nine o'clock in the morning and you're nearly blowing over the limit. Um, forget how many pickled onions you've eaten or how much, you know, perfume you've put on. We know you've had a drink. Um, so... I, I then, I was told not to go to AA by one of my drug and alcohol because he sat there and went, oh no, you don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go there. Not, you don't want the sort of people you're mixing with. Um, however, I did go to a, a woman's meeting on a Tuesday um, and completely fell apart. Totally fell apart in this meeting. Um, and I started going to meetings quite on a very regular basis every day because it gave me the excuse to leave my house, to buy a drink, to go to the meeting, to come home, to buy a drink, gave me the excuse to leave the house and my, my husband said, yes, yeah, she's going to a meeting, she's great. And because they knew me as that level of, of, of drinking, some people actually didn't, didn't even notice. I was in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for um, six months and I was going in blackout. I'd thrown the big book across the room in a meeting and said, how the effing hell can a book get me sober? Um, and was actually told after that, that was probably the most truthful thing I'd ever said in a meeting up until that point. Um, I was in a meeting, one of the very first meetings, um, I got a, a, you know, a drink in the car and some chap, um, sat in a, in a meeting and said, oh, I'm 34 years sober. And, and I, I know we're not allowed to swear on here, um, but you can imagine what I said to him because I can't, at this point for years, I couldn't see half an hour without a drink, let alone 34 years without a drink. That's just, you're lying to me, it's totally impossible. I stayed in those meetings for, for six months. Now, whether it's whether I didn't hear it didn't want to hear it, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. Nobody, I'm not saying they didn't, what I'm saying is I didn't hear it. So there's no blame going out there to anyone or into any meetings. However, I'm sitting there going in drunk and going, yeah, I'm three days sober. She's just drunk half a bottle of ice by the way. Excuse me, my dog's just scratching the drum. I'm just going to my ox, she's doing my head. Yes. Quick, quick. Terribly sorry. Um, but no one told me, everyone was saying that they were sober, whether it be they're sober six months, they're sober five years, six years, ten years. No one, no one told me how. No one told me. It was, it, all it was was don't pick up a drink. Don't pick up a drink. Keep coming back and don't pick up a drink. No one actually said what that, no one told me how not to. No one said, this is what you do. I saw the steps upon the wall. Um, and I'm like, yes, I'm step one, da, 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 da. But I just, it was just no one did. So I kept going to meetings. And I, this one Thursday, um, the 21st of January, 2016, my mom was staying with me. And um, she was so proud of me for not drinking my mom. Not that she didn't see the bottles of vodka that were hidden in the bushes behind the house or the front of the house or in the garage or in the bedroom or, or whatever. So I'd taken um, my mum to uh, a meeting on a 11 o'clock lunchtime 
and um, came out and everyone was saying how proud they were of me. And she was saying how proud she was of me. And I came back from that meeting and I have no, no idea why that day. Nothing had happened. Nothing dramatic had happened. I had had an argument. I, I wasn't overly drunk. I'd just topped up that day. And I made a phone call to a rehab. Um, and I don't remember making that phone call, but I remember the phone call back. And they said, when do you want to come in? And I went, now. And I went in the very next day. Hardest thing that I had to do was that morning of leaving, um, next a bottle of wine within about 30 seconds, but I didn't want to drink any more in case they breathalyzed me going into a rehab. Yeah. Um, was so by the time for me. Um, they went off to school. Um, I went into rehab for three months and it was the best thing I ever did. Whether you like rehab, don't like rehab, really don't care my story. Um, I needed to get, get, getting well in the rooms, brilliant, not my story, couldn't do it. Um, whether I didn't want to, whether I just wanted to escape from being bloody Doris Day for a while. I think that might, I think Doris Day wanted a nap. Um, and the rehab I went to actually um, worked from the big book. Um, and it was the best, and it was, in, it was in the pits of Leicester. You know, there was a drug dealer over the road and there was an off license on the corner. Um, and I became a sponge, an absolute sponge for the big book, for recovery. They did go through the steps really quickly in there. Um, I met some amazing people. Amazing people in there who I'm, I'm still in touch with now, a couple of them. Um, I came out of that and came out on the 15th. My, my, my last drink was the 22nd of, of April. My sobriety date, no alcohol day, was the 23rd of April 2016. Uh, sorry, 23rd of January 2016. Um, I went straight into the day I came out, the next day I went to a meeting and carried on doing that. Um, and I was told, what was wrong with me? What was wrong with me? Why am I dead inside? Why do I, can I not function for a moment? Why can I make, not, not make a phone call, send an email, answer the door, um, have a conversation with someone without having a drink in me? Why can I not? Why is it when I'm halfway down a bottle of vodka at 10 o'clock in the morning, am I having a panic attack because that's all I've got left? Half bottle of a litre of vodka, I wasn't, you know, I still wasn't going to say how much I was drinking. I was drinking a, a litre of bottle of vodka and anything else that was hanging around my house if I hadn't got it. Um, no one had told me why. No one had sat me down until I went into rehab. And, well, they probably tried, but I wasn't listening. And they say, you've got to be, you've got to be ready and you've got to want it. Um, at that point, I wanted it. At that point, I wanted to breathe without a drink, but I didn't know how to. Um, and no one told me that I have this reaction to alcohol, that when I take it, I get thirsty for it. You know, um, I don't get thirsty if you have a glass of water. I get, I have a reaction to alcohol that my husband doesn't have. My husband doesn't have three pints, becomes stupid, and then goes, oh, it's affecting me, I don't have any more. And I'm like, three pints, and I'm, you're not going to see me? I'm just going to go and hide, bury myself away in a, <laughs> in a room somewhere, or go and sit in the garage, or go and drive by to the recycling bins at the nearest supermarket and sit there for two hours while I'm drinking vodka. No one told me that I had this reaction to it. And I had to look back and see that looking back in my drinking, the times where I kept saying, I'm not going to drink today. I'm not going to drink today. And I get possibly to about 10 o'clock in the morning and I go, yeah. Or I go out and you know, I've managed not to have a drink during the day. But I'd go out and have a drink and it was, and that was it. We'd get home and I'd carry on drinking into the early hours of the morning 
perhaps until three or four o'clock in the morning because I couldn't stop. And I can't, don't understand why you don't want another drink. Why don't you want another drink? Surely you want another drink. No one told me that I got this reaction to alcohol, the phenomenon of craving. That's okay if that's all that's wrong with me. If that was all that's wrong with me, this is what I was told, this is what going through the big book was said they were selling me. That if that's okay, just don't have a drink, Helen. Don't have a drink. Let's have a look in your past and see where that worked, hey, shall we? So I had to look. What is why if I'm if I haven't had a drink, which was I found that one a bit difficult because there wasn't really a time when I hadn't had a drink. So I looked at the two times that I've gone to that I've, I've done home detox. You know, I've gone to those two times or the odd day we were on holiday and we were traveling. But she'd find drink on the on the plane, or she'd go and hide in the airport and go to those little kiosks where you can just go and buy the little bottles of wine and then go and hide in the toilet. So I looked at those two weeks, those two weeks of I haven't had a drink. And at that point, I'm never having another drink. That that was what it was, you know, total abstinence, didn't want to drink again. So you dropped your mum at the station and then you're never going to have a drink again, but you thought it was a good idea to go and have it, to, to go and buy some vodka and have a drink on the way home. Not realising that actually it was the mental obsession. It was, you're going to have a drink. No matter what, whether I wanted to or not, I was going to have a drink. My head was going to take me to that drink. So I found out that these two elements of, of me Makes me an alcoholic. My children, in the book, it gives us the, 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 different, the different types of alcoholic or different types of drinker. My children would find bottles going through my house, put them in my kitchen, cry, and say, Mommy, please don't drink anymore. Please don't drink anymore. They'd come home from school and find me on the settee asleep. And they'd say, please don't. And I'd go, okay, I won't, I won't do it, I won't do it. And absolutely mean it from the bottom of my heart. And then I'd be found having a drink again and be found on the settee again the next day. It didn't matter how much I didn't want to drink, I had to drink. I had lost all choice in the matter. I had no choice but to drink. And until I understood that, then... You know, until we actually tell people what is bloody wrong with them, not just don't drink and come to bloody meetings, you know, great. But how do I not pick up that next drink? How do I go through, you know, I've gone three days. I've gone through, I've gone through three weeks. I've gone, you know, three months without a drink. And I'm like this. I'll keep, I'll keep coming back. Keep coming back. Keep coming to meetings. So then what do I do then? I was then taken through the steps. And they were taken through in three months in rehab. Um, I came out, I, find, I found, um, I was turned down by three women in the meetings because they'd got two sponsors each, couldn't take on another one. So my first sponsor um, um, was a gentleman in, in my home group who, his wife was also in the fellowship and, and he sponsored me for about 18 months. Great, thank you very much. And then... Um, I was doing, I was thrown into service straight away in, in, in AA. I started making some amends. Um, and then I'd ask somebody to do the, um, no, I don't know if my, if, if my sponsor is on here. Maybe, he maybe he isn't, but sorry. Um, I asked him to go through this, this gentleman to go through the traditions with me and, and, and the concepts. And, um, this gentleman was 30, 30 years in sobriety, had got a wealth of experience, um, and there was no BS in at all with this chap. Um, and um, my first sponsor was great, did an amazing job, and then I asked this gentleman to be my sponsor. So for those who can't keep it within, you know, this gentleman, don't work, don't care. This is absolutely straight, straight as an arrow. <laughs> And um, one thing my sponsor showed me was options. Never told me to do anything, gave me options. Now, I'm uh, still my sponsor today, and I have the most, if you haven't got a sponsor, please get a sponsor. 
Um, my sponsor has done service throughout his sobriety. I think he's 33, 34 years now. I might give him an extra year or less year. Um, I actually gave him an, I actually said he was a year older than he was a couple of weeks ago and he wasn't too pleased with me. Um, however, um, yeah, he gives me options and sits with me and discusses things with me um, and doesn't, and, you know, and, and doesn't hold back where he can see where it's me that's at fault or um, where, you know, I came out of school with no education. I had no qualifications whatsoever. Um, my sponsor shared his experience that he started doing volunteer work. Why don't you give it a go? So you know, there's an option for you. I went and started doing volunteer work. I went from volunteer work, I went in to get a, a qualification um, in counselling. Um, to have someone who has got experience, who has been in service all of their sobriety, who walks the walk, doesn't just sit there and talk the talk, who walks the walk of this program is, is invaluable and I have the most utmost respect, adore him, um, I really do. Um, when I was, I was going to jump back a little bit. When I was in, um, in Reba, we, we look at the steps and, and we, <laughs> I remember I looked at the steps and I could do, you know, step one. Okay. Yeah. Get it. Got that one. Step two came to believe my God of my childhood was this Catholic God. Um, my experience, not touching anybody else's. Um, my God was a real punishing badass who, if I was going to do anything wrong, I'm just going to go and burn in the bowels of hell, you know, for the rest of, you know, for the rest of my entire life and sit in purgatory or wherever and be prayed out of it. Um, initially, that was okay. But for my step two, over a period of time, that has grown my higher power or the power behind the word God has changed. It's changed to this girl who, girl, this woman who couldn't see an hour, half an hour without a drink has now gone five and a half years today, or five years, six months over today. I didn't do that. I did not do that. And it's that day that you go, I haven't thought about a drink today. I actually haven't thought about a drink today. And that came quite quickly. And that was almost, that was really my coming to believe. That was like, well, I haven't done this. All I've done is get, is, is do what it tells me to do in the book. Get on my knees in the morning, get on my knees at night, do some inventory, be the best I can be and be of service to others. And I haven't really had to do much more than that. Step three, turn my will and my life over to the power of God. However, at my, that point, I'm just going to carry on with the steps. That's that, that to me, that was step three. Just turn it over to AA. Turn it over to it. Turn it over to the steps. Turn my life over to the book. Let me carry on with the work. Step four, make a list of all the people that you're angry with. Piece of cake. Not a problem with that one. Reading it out to somebody else. That was a, that was a little bit more difficult because it was like, yeah, well, I'm writ and then yeah, well, have a look at yourself, Helen. You know, let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at you. Where have you been in all of this? However, let's look at your assets as well, girl. Let's have a look at what you are, you know, how you, you do, how about you do. I used to hold people hostage. That was one of mine. And I used to write IOUs because I thought I was so lovely. I would do anything for you. I would look after your children. I would drive you here. I'd be drunk, but I'd drive you there. Um, I would do anything, but I'd have an IOU. I've looked after your kids for two days. Ah, you can have mine for four. Um, you know, I've driven you there. Yeah, but so you're going to drive me twice as far. And um, I've done that for you, and you haven't said thank you and haven't said how wonderful I am for doing it. That was, that was a real pattern of mine because I thought I was so lovely. Actually, I was just a selfish, selfish, but didn't really... See, that's the thing, not realising that was, that was who, who we become. Um, step six, I <laughs> looked at it went, okay, yeah, right, okay, yeah, 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 you can have it, have them, please. I don't want to be that person anymore. 
and then just asking step eight. Step eight I found was one of my hardest. And the reason I found that, I was listening to, and I'll tell you why, I was listening to, um, the, I'm, I was, you know, I never laid a finger on my children. Um, never, I shouted, but I would never use bad language. Never verbally, you know, never physically beat them or anything else. So I'm not a child abuser, not at all. I heard a speaker once, Polly P, um, who I think is an amazing lady, um, say that she'd never touched her kids or verbally abused them. However, she was a child abuser. And I, that, that took me back so much. And I thought, I'm not a child abuser. And I had to look. I drove my car with four children in it whilst drink, while of having a drink and still drinking. Um, I put drink before my children. I didn't find out until I was sober that my children used to go to school and all they did at school was worry about what state mum would be when they got home. I didn't know that my family had had a family meeting about what would happen if my children came home and found me dead on the setting. Now, if that isn't child abuse, I don't know what is. Um, however, amends have been made. I have the most amazing relationship with my children. Um, they, they are just, they are just fab. They're not children anymore. They're all adults. But, um, and for those who, and from my experience, um, same, you could sit them down, depending on their age. Mine were in their teens at the time, and my, my son was 19 at the time. Um, so doing my amends with them. But on a daily basis, they see that. They understand that my sobriety comes first, no matter what. But they know that their mum is there now that she actually can hug them and say, I love you and really mean it from the bottom of her heart. Um, and they're, they're fab. They annoy the hell out of me completely. I mean, they're all grown, still at home, and there can be, there's seven adults in this house and they can be shouting and screaming and whatever, and I can actually very easily now thank you to my sponsor, Detach. Um, most of the time, not all the time. Um, so step eight was, was and, and the worry that I brought to my parents, the, the um, you know, I stole peace of mind from a lot of people. The hurt that I caused my husband. Um, and there was other things that I'd done that I, I wouldn't share here. But the one thing is, is that my sponsor knows all about them, all about them. And for the, the few of the things that I've done that I would never tell anybody else, if anyone's worried about that, I sat with my sponsor and told them, told him that a, a few things, and my sponsor shared experiences of things that he wasn't in, that he wasn't proud of, and that made me see me feel so much more comfortable that actually I wasn't this horrendous piece of, of, of dirt that, that could have possibly done those things that somebody else out there understood. Um, step nine, and I'll explain just just one. If anyone's uh, <laughs> my sister-in-law, who um, who this woman was a cancer within me, trust me, and a cancer. Her name was not mentioned in the house. The phone call was phone calls were not answered. She wasn't allowed to come to the house. She wasn't allowed to see the, her, her nieces and her nieces and nephew. And my husband wasn't allowed to have a relationship with her really. Um, and you've got to make a men tell them, not happening, not happening. I was prepared to bury this woman alive in a glass coffin and then put the soil on her whilst watching her and laughing. However, um, at about six months sober, and I, and I seriously was not going to make this amend. I just couldn't do it. I hated this woman so much. Um, but it was eating me. It was really eating me alive. And I knew if I didn't make amends that I'm, I'm going to drink on this. I'm going to drink on that hatred. I'm going to drink on that resentment. Um, and I remember going to a Sunday morning meeting and just sitting there going, come on, we're going to have to do it. We're, we're, we're going to have to do this, aren't we? And just talking to whatever that I don't understand. I don't understand. If I understood, understood what power it was, then it wouldn't be more powerful than me. That's why I look at it. Um, 
and got in my car and kept saying, oh, but stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. She lived in my village. She bought a house in my village. Can you believe the goal of this woman? Um, so instead of turning into my gates, I carried on driving and just going, come on, stay with me, stay with me. And I drove to a house. Now, this is a woman, and I really, well, I can't, I can't tell, express how much I hated her. Um, and I knocked on her door, and she opened the door, and she went, I've been waiting for you to visit. She said, I've been waiting for your visit. And I went in, and I said my amends of how I'd stolen her relationship with her niece and nephew, with her nephews and uh, her nephew and her nieces, how I'd stolen the relationship from her brother, um, that, that, you know, the, the bad man. I I turned my whole family against this woman. This wasn't just me hating her. I decided that everyone's got to hate her if I hate her, because I wanted everyone on my side. Um, and at the end of it, when I said, you know, um, how can I make this right? And is there anything you'd like to add? Bless her heart, she turned around and went, I'm really sorry for all I've done for you, all I've done to you. And we stood up, hugged. She now comes in here. We haven't sat and broken bread together. And she's not, she isn't somebody I would have gone out and, and done that with anyway. But I make coffee. She comes, she'll come into the house. We chat, we have a laugh. That is building relationships. That is, you know, if there's any prime example that any a broken relationship can be mended, it's that one. Very quickly, I know I'm really, gosh, I'm really now to time. There's me thinking 50 minutes was too much. Um, what has, and, and I try, I try to live in steps, um, 10, 11, and 12. Um, I have, um, and I'm going to give you the importance of, of the sponsor. Um, I've been going through some massive fears recently, massive fears. Um, and uh, with the help of my sponsor, um, who actually told me to get on my knees and pray and whatever, you know, which I have done constantly, and to face my fear and walk through that fear. Um, do you know what? Still here, most amazing experience ever. Um, but I've worked with through with my sponsor over the last few years, detachment, fears, um, things that go through my head that that I can't see but my sponsor can just look at me and go, what's up? Who knows everything about me? Um, that is that, uh, you know, and prayer, meditation, I'm not brilliant at, but contemplation of a reading, which is what my top sponsor taught me, do a reading and contemplate the reading in the morning. Um, work with somebody else. Get you out of you, Helen, which which I do. I'm, I, I do service. I'm back into service now again, um, an intergroup. What's the AA has the, the fellowship, whatever power you want to call it, and AA has given to me in five what well, was given to me in five and a half years. Um I can love again. I have got an, an abundance of friends. I have some really, really, really close friends. I have amazing people in a, in a, in a small circle. Um, I have, I've been very lucky enough to be able to travel to, to the States, to the Wilson House, the Stepping Stone, to some conventions in the States, which I've loved. Um, it's given me the opportunity, um, and I've mentioned Katie on here, um, to be of service to my sister, who, um, and I, you hear, you hear it, don't you? That for as much as you want to pick them up and 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 carry them, I couldn't do that. I had to wait for the phone call, and the phone call came. Um, and like I say, she's four months today, and I'm just so proud of. And she does work hard, and her sponsor is amazing as well. Um, it's given me a voice. It's given me, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got, you know, a qualification now. Um, I'm actually going through a divorce in sobriety, sober, without fear, um, because I've been honest. But the biggest gift it gave me was my dad passed away March 12 months ago. And um, 
was speaking the toll the day before his 74th birthday that um, he had got kidney cancer. Um, that was in the July. My dad passed away on the 10th of March last year. Now, what being sober did was that I was able to be there for my mum and my family, be able to make copious amounts of coffee, but I was able to sit with my dad and hold his hand when he took his last breath. And, yeah, do you know what? I was broken and sad. I remember my sponsor, I remember saying to my sponsor that even though I was broken and sad, and, you know, I held his hand and, and, and with his last breath and then opened the window and, and, and let him go. Um, I can still honestly say that I was the most content that I'd ever been in my life. Um, I actually jumped about him last night because I was worried about this meeting and I dreamt that he was listening in onto the meeting. So if you're listening, Dad, there you go. You were brought up into it anyway. It's, um, it's given me the opportunity to help other women and, and men. It's given me the opportunity to look to the future, not too much far into the future, to create a life, to find things that I never knew that Doris Day actually, who is now well dead and buried, but Helen can actually enjoy doing that. Um, it's given me, like I say, my sister coming in. I have got friendships. Um, and if there's anyone struggling and anyone not hearing a message, it isn't just about not picking a drink up and going to meetings. It's about sitting down and doing some work with another human being, finding something that you believe in, putting some action in, and on a daily basis. We don't pick a drink up on a daily basis. I don't even think about it now. You know, I lost the choice in drink back then. I've lost the choice in drink now. I don't wake up in the morning and go, I'm not going to drink today. I wake up in the morning and go, good morning. It's given me peace of mind. Um, I can still go off on one and my head can still, you know, the, 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 the chatter can still go. But I know what it is now. I know what it is now and I know what I need to do with it. I either sit and meditate on it, I read something in the book, I read a lot of different spiritual books, I listen to, to books. I'm not perfect in any stretch, any way, <laughs> any, any way whatsoever. But, you know, good, order, direct, or good orderly direction, the principles of AA. Service, service is, it was massive until lockdown, and now it's back massive again. Um, and just loving, I'm loving, loving my life. I can't tell you how much I love my life, even though I'm going through divorce, even though, you know, I, my life can be, the future can be really scary on your own and whatever. Never be on my own now, I've got my four children. How can I ever be on? I can't be on my own, I've got four children. How can I ever be on my own? So I just want to say, I hope someone got something from that. Um, if you didn't, go and listen to another meeting, listen to another speaker. However, thank you so much, Mel. Thank you all for having the patience to listen to me bottle on. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.